My topic is using diversity intelligence for understanding equity and leader, diversity leadership capability. And when you hear the word diversity, if you're like me, it's like, oh my goodness, not once again, not that word. When I moved to Arkansas, it's been 13 years almost, I've heard the word diversity more in the last 13 years than in my entire life, and I was born in South Carolina. So this southern accent isn't going anywhere. Um, I'm not a diversity researcher. My passion, I teach human resource development. And my passion is valuing people and technology in the workplace. And that passion derived from my very first job. I was a chemist. I started out as a chemist from Clemson University. And my doctor told me find another career because you can't breathe these chemicals. I could not talk from after a day of work around chemicals. So I said, what am I going to do? I've got a chemistry degree. This is my passion. I know I want to be a college professor at some point. How do I get there? And so what I decided to do is I did a pros and cons list. What are the pros of every job I've had and what are the cons? And the cons weren't things that I would never do. They were just things I preferred not to do if I had a choice. And so after making that list, I said, you know, I could be a trainer. I could train people on how to use chemicals. I can train people on processes. I can train people on systems because I worked in manufacturing or operations. And so that valuing people and technology concept came from my experience as a chemist in a manufacturing facility and watching employees mark an X for their paycheck in 1991. I couldn't believe it. You know, I graduated in 91. I go in this facility with 1,100 employees. Never thought that people couldn't read and write and they're working in a high tech performance company. And so I started looking at how we were investing over $31 million in equipment. But we were investing virtually nothing in people development. But we were going after certifications and you're gonna need people when the auditors come in, because they're not going to talk to managers, they're going to talk to the everyday folks that you have working for you. So I came up with five common values between people and technology. And those values are location, use, maintenance, modification, and time value. And the example I use is, before you buy a piece of equipment, or in common language, if you buy a computer, you know where you're going to put it. Even with the laptop, you might buy a case for it. You, you know where you're going to put it to keep it safe. You're gonna, you know how you're going to use it. You know how you're going to maintain it. And in major corporations, they may hire an entire maintenance staff just for that one piece of equipment. You guys know if you're on a college campus, you know where the computer technical support people are <laughs> because you want to maintain your computer. And you know how you're going to modify it. As things change, an organization isn't going to buy a piece of equipment that can't modify they can't modify as their processes change, excuse me, change. And so with computers, you buy it, you want enough RAM, you want enough so that as things change, you can adjust. The same with time value. With equipment, they know they're going to depreciate it on their balance sheet. People don't have that same option. You either retire, you work in a state that's at will, where you can quit at any time or they can fire you for no reason. So with that in mind, I realize that technology development has a head start on people development in organizations. And so my focus is not to say that people are less than technology. You need both to exist. My research looks at how do you value the technology development and the people development. You hear a lot about robots. When I was in industry, robots were already there. You know, so people have to have the knowledge to operate the robots. The Japanese tried it in the 90s. They tried to run an entire plant on an off shift with no people. It didn't work. You have to have people. So when you read a lot of the articles today and they talk about robots are going to replace people, they may replace some jobs, but the, um, as long as you have people development, you can still maintain your job in organization. And that's what I do. I help um, students learn how to design training programs 
to leverage both technology and people in the workplace. And out of that came my term interpersonal diversity. And when you talk about interpersonal diversity, I look at computer programmers, look at Google, SAS Institute, um, Microsoft, Facebook. They have all sorts of computer programmers. All of them are technically in the same job. However, they look at the variety of skills that these employees bring and they leverage that. Another example is in team sports. We in March Madness now, so basketball teams, most of them have about three guards on the team. Even though all of them are guards, they are allowed to leverage their strengths, even across the organization. But sometimes in organizations like call centers, you give an employee a script, a script to read, and that's their only option. You don't allow them to think. You don't allow them to be creative. And in a lot of um, jobs, and that's why a lot of manufacturing jobs left the U.S., all the people were in the same job category, but you didn't give them the flexibility to think and make adjustments. And they only did what they were told to do. And so when I talk about interpersonal diversity, I'm talking about using those five values to analyze each person and not as if you're analyzing a piece of equipment, treat them like human beings, and recognize their job performance strengths. Even though they got the same title, you're paying them the same thing, they bring a location value that may be of an asset to you. They may bring a use value that is not just what's on their job description. They matched the job on their resume, they matched the job description that you provided, but they bring other skills and you have to maintain those skills. But if the employee goes out, and all of you college students, when you go out and you get your first job, when you decide, oh, I want to go back and get a certification. I may want to go get a master's degree. Your organization may not value that. They may pay for it with um, tuition assistance, but there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to use that skill on that job because some of them just want what you can provide at that moment what they need in order to get the job done. And I think our speaker earlier this morning alluded to that some, but what it does is this helps if you can uh, maintain their skills, let them modify their skills and their time value to your organization. If they decide to retire early, it makes room for new employees. But if they decide, I wanna stay here and retire, you need systems. And some of those systems are like skill-based pay system, performance-based pay systems. And when I managed a skill-based pay system for an organization, I would have older employees come to me and say, look, I don't want to do anything else. And I'm looking at them, I'm saying, well, you know, if you don't go through the system, you don't get a pay raise. And they're like, I'm okay with that. So we had to go in and develop a grandfathering clause where we could grandfather them into that particular position, but they still had to meet the demands, the productivity demands as they increased without having to go through that particular system. But new employees, they had no choice. They had to go through the skill pay, based pay system the way it was designed. But without that interpersonal diversity of thought about each individual employee that works for you, you lose value because either they get frustrated and leave, or they stay in there miserable, and they make everybody around them miserable, and so you got a miserable organization. And as I continue to work on this value in people and technology in the workplace, I evolved to the term diversity intelligence. And I define diversity intelligence as the capabilities of individuals to recognize the value of workplace diversity and use the information to guide their thinking and behavior. I know people saying, well, you've already got diversity training, you got diversity education, and my opinion is you've got failure. And the reason I say it has failed is because you're still spending, despite spending multi-billions of dollars on diversity training and diversity education, you still have EOC complaints, that Equal Oppor Employment Opportunity Commission complaints. You still have legal settlements 
daily Department of Labor dis settlements based on discrimination. The, the other reason I say it fails is because the diversity training focuses on awareness, they've added inclusion, access has always been there, but the pieces that I describe as missing are, is the understanding, the equity, and without those two, you don't have the diversity leadership capability. And if, once you achieve that, then your follower well-being, the people that work for you as a leader, will be protected from discrimination. You'll be the one protecting them, and you'll be protecting your organization from it. You'll have reduced turnover. You'll have improved job productivity. Nobody comes to work miserable and do a good job. I don't know anybody that does. I mean, you might know people that come to work and they lolly jolly every day, and they're miserable after being treated bad. And increased motivation. If you treat, treat them well, they'll motivate others to do well. So when I look at DQ and understanding, I talked about how the traditional diversity training focuses on awareness and in inclusion. But all of diversity needs to be applied in context. Because when you look at diversity, the word just means different. There's no, nothing else to the word, it's just different. And the overarching context of diversity for understanding in America, and I'm putting this in the American context because that's where diversity originated in the workplace, in the global conglomerates you see it all. And it came through Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, when it was first introduced, in America, it was from the settlers. When they came over to North America, their goal was they felt they were ordained or destined by God to conquer North America, to settle the entire continent of North America. And they never racialized it until after the Civil War. And after the Civil War, it became more racialized, and you had the diversity, the separation of the American Indians the blacks as slaves. This ideology then migrated from society into the workplace. They haven't separated it out, and that's why you see what you see today, is there's no separation between that thought that we're better, we're superior, and we're ordained by God to be su superior. Not all, but that's where it originated. And so diversity in context is vital. You can't just separate it out and say, oh, I've got diversity. You've got difference. You don't have diversity of action and behavior. And so it was introduced into the workplace after affirmative action. And affirmative action was designed to protect minorities and women, and it was only in workplaces that had federal contracts. And even today, if you're not in a workplace that has a federal contract, you are not obligated to do affirmative action. And that's that lack of understanding that a lot of people don't have, and they think every workplace in America is protected by affirmative action. And with my students, I only teach working adults. I teach master's and doctoral level students. And even our undergrads are required to have at least three years of work experience. So they are working people, and so, when I give them an assignment, they'll um, submit something about affirmative action. I never tell a student they're wrong. I just don't. I just say, can you verify that? Can you provide a reference that supports your position? So when they go out and they start looking it up, and they come back and say, well, dang, I didn't even know that. There's not a law in America that says you have to have diversity in the workplace. There's no diversity law, none. There are legal actions that protect different groups of employees in the workplace. And I've listed them there. If you want a copy of this, you can have it. But when you really look at who's protected in the workplace, there's only one unprotected group in the workplace. And they're white males, and not all of them. You've got to be under 40, because at under 40, you, at age 40 and above, you're protected by age discrimination non-religious, if you don't have a religious belief, non-disabled, 
you have no type of disability, you're a non-veteran, you're non-LGBTQ, and you're not protected by Title VII. So when you look at that, there are very, very, very few unprotected employees in any workplace, specifically those with federal contracts and protected by federal law. Other workplaces often use um, state, local laws, or internal policies. But a lot of this misinformation leads to inequity and a lack of diversity leadership capability. Because if you don't know this, you see it on every job application at the bottom, but most people don't read it. They just want the job. They feel, you know, they have it hanging up on, a, on the wall in the workplace for you to read your workplace rights. But how many of you ever read those posters? I haven't ever read them. <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest, but I teach legal and ethical issues, so I read the textbooks and some of the laws. But most people don't even look at it, so you have a lot of misinformation. And so when I started looking at how do I get all employees protected in the workplace, I said, well, the missing piece is the intelligence. Because you got a whole lot of ignorance, but you have very little intelligence around diversity. And so without leaders having that capability to utilize what they learn, because education and training does not equal intelligence. I promise you it does not. So my premise is that you need to integrate diversity intelligence alongside intellectual intelligence, emotional intelligence, and cultural intelligence. And I get a lot of pushback saying, oh, you got diversity with, you got diversity covered under cultural intelligence. Most of the cultural intelligence literature focuses on international. You've got diversity within culture. And a lot of people don't take the time to understand the differences across cultures or within the cultures. So in order to treat all employees fairly, honestly, and with integrity, you need the intelligence to understand all of these laws and rules and policies so that everybody who's a leader of employees and those who aren't, you might be a um, leader without a title, but you're still a leader in an organization, you need to recognize the difference between yourself and others without it being an obstacle. Just because you're different doesn't mean it needs to be an obstacle to performance. And reflect on your actions, your personal actions. I don't talk about the bias and the institutional racism because I deal with each individual. And I think if we all deal with each individual and understand who they are, using that interpersonal diversity and diversity intelligence and knowing what the facts are, then we can value the differences in employees without attempting to make everyone alike. And then embrace the differences as strengths rather than weaknesses and stop trying to fit everything and everybody into every diversity initiative. I'm, I like the word inclusion, but everybody doesn't need to be included in everything. And a lot of them don't want to be included. You know, so just because it's a diversity initiative does not mean that you need to be a part of it. And so from my perspective, growing up in South Carolina, moving to Arkansas, and some of the experiences that I've had, I just feel like I don't believe that there's that much difference between people. We're all human beings. We all want people to like us. We all have passions and beliefs. We just need to make sure that those passions and beliefs are harnessed in factual information versus opinions and biases and stereotypes. Thank you.